incident response, malware triage. So even uh, as a red, I cur currently focusing more on the red team side, I really enjoy leaning in and helping uplift detections and collaborating um, with blue teamers, especially since I have that background. Um, a personal area of interest of mine is Mac OS post exploitation. So that's usually where I spend my free time, where if I'm not playing a Zelda Breath of the Wild with, with my kids, I'm doing that. I will caveat and say that I am trash at uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild. I pretty much have to ask my kids and they tell me where to go and I just go and it works. But uh, when I'm not doing Breath of the Wild, I'm, I'm usually working on some side project around uh, Mac OS post exploitation. Um, I enjoy 80s and 90s nostalgia, so I'll have little pictures throughout the presentation reflecting that. And I am on Twitter with the handle at Seth Owens. I uh, also want to shout out uh, Chris Ross, uh, also goes by Zorier at Spectre Ops. Um, I consider him to be what I call like the forefather of Mac OS security research. Uh, well, both Chris Ross and um, uh, Patrick Wardle. And uh, so I just wanted to shout both of them out and uh, just thank them for the groundwork that they have laid and how they have opened the door for people like myself to come behind them years later and build and innovate on the work that they've done. So just kind of looking at the agenda of what I plan to go through, I plan to briefly talk about uh, what I call the State of the Union for Mac OS, look at some common deployments and attack opportunities associated with those deployments. Then I also plan to look at the attack, uh, the kill chain from the attacker's perspective and what that looks like in the Mac OS environment. Also, I plan to discuss adversary emulations, simulations, along with some challenges and opportunities unique to Mac OS. And then I plan to close out with uh, defensive recommendations. So from a State of Union perspective, if you look at the, the world outside of the little sliver of the San Francisco Bay Area, you'll notice that in those, most of those environments, uh, the vast majority of desktop operating systems are Windows with very small percentage of Windows uh, of Mac OS. So you can see stats here at the bottom that kind of reflects the world outside of the Bay where you're probably around 80% Windows and just under 20% Mac OS. However, if you look in at the tech uh, companies specific to the Bay Area, those numbers actually flip where you may, it's, it's very, very common where you may see Mac OS makes uh, 80 to 90 percent of endpoints with Windows only being 10. And so uh, that's a that, that part has been an uh, interesting, interesting facet for me and kind of what drove me into uh, digging and spending more time on the Mac OS side. And from an endpoint detection and response over the years, I noticed when EDR initially came out years ago, uh, it was mostly Windows support with very little Linux or Mac. And then over time, Linux and Mac started to become supported. Initially, those were really just kind of like raw logs with no intelligence or analysis around it. But if you fast forward to today, um, EDR, even for Mac OS, has come a long way and uh, even has some decent detections out of the box. Some of them are even pulling threat intelligence data sources. So. Um, there's definitely room for opportunity, but I definitely wanted to mention as well the progress that I personally have seen with EDR products as they relate to Mac. And of course, you also have more malware that's targeting Mac endpoints. And you can look at Patrick Wardle's Mac Malware of 2019 report. It's a great example of looking at um, examples of real world instances where Mac, uh, Macs are being targeted and what that looks like. So. Given what the world looks like outside of the Bay, there's still a lot of discomfort with targeting Mac OS. There's a lot of questions on both the red and blue side. Some of the offensive questions include like, what payloads should I use? How do you build those payloads? What languages do I need to learn? How do you get access to a Mac? Uh, then once you get access, what do you do? Is there any relationship to Active Directory? Um, endpoint detection and security products, what should I be worried about? And so for this talk, I uh, plan to cover as much as I can. I won't be able to go as deep as I want because I'm trying to cover um, a large like array of topics, but I hope to answer as many of these as possible during the presentation. Uh, before I jump in, just wanted to share my perspective on what I consider to be some goals of red team operations. So you can see a picture there of jujitsu. I'm actually a white belt in jujitsu. And so this, this picture resonated with me. And I think about uh, kind of the relationship that guys like Tim Malcolm Vetter and others in, in the red team space and how they've compared uh, cybersecurity, blue versus red, to jujitsu. And I think it's a very great um, analogy because as a student in jujitsu, I was often taught moves and I was taught both how to 
like execute the moves and how to defend the moves. And you have to know both to really be successful. And I think that really ties over well into like red blue operations where red teams really need to understand defenses and detections and the artifacts you're leaving on the system. And I think blue teams really need to understand offense and what those capabilities are, what the attacker mindset are. It's like the two are kind of merging and, uh, through challenging and working together with each other's skill sets. So some of the specific goals I think about for Red Team Ops, I think about the goal of testing detections, right? You wanna make sure the efficacy of detections is high quality. You also wanna look at testing your response and not just the ability to respond, but how adequately can the response lead to remediation. Uh, also thinking about testing preventions that have been put in place and making sure those are working as expected. Uh, one question I like to answer personally is, if an adversary with these types of capabilities went after our organization, how would we fare? How far would the adversary get? How long could they stay in the environment before blue team sees them? How long would it take blue team to completely eradicate them? Things like that. I think that gives a lot of good contextual uh, perspective to the operation. And then, as I mentioned before, I really enjoy collaboration with Blue to actually uplift detection. So instead of just throwing a report over with detection recommendations, I actually enjoy getting in, uh, digging into Splunk or EDR consoles, and just actually working side by side to build and validate detections. So let's look at some common deployments in uh, Mac OS environments. So I do want to reference one source that I thought was really good. I think you should read on it if you're interested in the space. But uh, Luke Roberts and Caleb Hall, they did a talk at Objective by the Sea where they talked about uh, Jamf from an attacker's perspective. Definitely check that out. Um, I just pulled a few points from their presentation around common management methods that I personally have seen in my experience. Uh, so the first group is what I would call one-offs. So those are uh, environments where you'll find macOS hosts, but they're not, they're not managed by the IT department. So there may be some engineers or developers who uh, are allowed to purchase Macs through the company for different reasons, but those Macs are not uh, managed by the IT organization. So then you have a second group that's more custom, and those are your very mature, large, well-funded organizations like your Apples, Facebooks, Googles. Uh, those organizations will have a large presence of Macs, but they'll have custom infrastructure, like uh, their own uh, LDAP infrastructure. They may have their own custom uh, mobile device management, which is like tied to the LDAP and is used to manage the Mac endpoints. So again, very well-resourced, but uh, given the amount of funding and bodies you need, that's usually not the most common method you see. The most common I typically tend to see is the third group there, which is managed with commercial tools. The uh, specific commercial tools I'm most familiar with is Jamf Pro, uh, but I've also been reading about Kanji that's up and coming. So that's one I'm gonna keep an eye on. But uh, Jamf Pro is very common and they even purchased uh, Patrick Wardle's company, which I think is amazing because uh, Patrick Wardle's company has been doing a lot of uh, bleeding edge research. So it's going to be really cool to see how they, how uh, Jamf Pro brings in the security aspect over time. So uh, common Jamf deployments, you have your uh, Jamf admin server, you have, uh, and that's pretty much where the admins that, that uh, run the Jamf infrastructure can configure policies, apps, packages, that will in turn manage the Jamf agents, which is your Mac endpoint. And each endpoint will have an agent, it communicates with the server. And then of course, uh, on the managed endpoint, you also have self-service, which is where uh, users can install packages or apps that IT has already vetted. So it's a really neat infrastructure. Again, this is at a 10,000 foot view. There's definitely some other components, but I just wanna show you some of the main pieces uh, for uh, Jamf infrastructure. And so, as I mentioned, you can see how the uh, Mac endpoints are managed by the Jamf server with policies, packages, scripts. Um, and then what's, what's also common is the Jamf server will have Active Directory binding often on the back end, which will allow uh, like synchronization with passwords. What often also happens with Active Directory is the groups that basically the access to the Jamf server is often controlled by an AD group, such as like Jamf admins or Casper admins. And so what's interesting is you think about some of the reasons why people often cite moving from Windows to Mac, which is to reduce the, the threat surface. But when you tie in Active Directory on the back end, 
a lot of those same threats are kind of, or attack vectors are really much, are pretty much reintroduced into your environment. It's just that now the front end, like the front door might be a little different. Like there's probably a higher chance you land on a Mac and you'll have to navigate that. But once you do so, you still will then have access to Active Directory and a lot of those attacks will uh, still apply. Uh, another aspect for Jamf that's interesting is the remote management aspect. So in some environments, remote management might be set up by the Jamf admin for things like screen sharing on the managed endpoints. And if that's set up, then there's often an admin account that has SSH access to those managed endpoints. Uh, for those specific purposes. And so one thing I always think about is if remote management is enabled, is there a static password being used? So that brings back very similar to like um, local admin password management on a Windows side where LAPS is used to randomize that password. So you can't just get one password and use it on every endpoint. Uh, that same thing would apply here, where if you're just using a, st a static password for remote management, that password gets compromised and you can now access any um, organization managed Mac that has SSH exposed. Also, uh, the Jamf API is, is very interesting. And again, access is often controlled by the Jamf AD group. So it's usually like Jamf admins or Casper admins, whatever the name of that group is. And uh, as you can see here by default, um, in, in most environments or a lot of environments, you'll see it listening on 8443, and then you can hit like JSS resource accounts to list out accounts or computers, policies. One interesting thing too is uh, you can also, once you, once you um, are enumerating on a specific computer, you can actually check for remote management, as you can see here in the red box, and you can see if remote management is set to true, and if it is, you can see the account name, and it's the SHA-256 hash string. And so if you check like multiple computers and you're seeing that same SHA-256 hash string and account name, then there's a good chance that there is a static password being used on every endpoint. So uh, next, I'm gonna jump into some common points of interest from a red team perspective in modern um, IT environments. So of course, one is gonna be the CICD pipeline, just because uh, it's such a consistent way to deploy code and images in an environment, and it's so common, and it's built on trust relationships and dependencies across various components. So using this very basic example, like a developer commits code, which triggers a Jenkins build to create and push an image, which eventually gets rolled out to Kubernetes. So if you look at this flow, let's say, uh, the Kubernetes pods and nodes and containers are all configured well, uh, by best practice, like system anonymous access for the nodes is not is not set up. Uh, there's no vulnerabilities, no attack paths that I could leverage to compromise uh, there. However, let's say we look upstream and let's, let's say Jenkins is misconfigured, right? It's on a vulnerable host or it's set up without authentication. Or even if we go further upstream and compromise the developer's laptop, and we get access and we find a Jenkins key or other tokens or SSH keys, things like that, that are on their machine that we can leverage, then we can follow the flow of the CICD pipeline and still get access to those, uh, those containers. So even though we can't directly attack them, we can kind of walk uh, upstream and find misconfigurations and still get access to the CICD pipeline. What's so interesting about that too is, depends on the environment, but that CICD pipeline could also carry you from one environment over to the other. So if you're in corp, you could possibly ride it into prod. You know, it all depends on the environment and best practices and what, what's being done, but it's a very interesting attack point. Um, another one is secrets. Uh, secrets, I think, are just, as, an, as a red team, I enjoy secrets because they're, they're pretty hard to detect and uh, there's not a lot of analytics and in, in a lot of environments around abuse of secrets. Um, and so you've got secrets in a lot of different places, like you have HashiCorp Vault, which is what I consider to be the standard in a lot of tech companies now for application secrets management. And so you may find an environment where they have HashiCorp Vault, but they took the image from HashiCorp, modified it, or they put it on a uh, vulnerable server that introduces attack paths where you can leverage that as an attacker, get access to application secrets. Um, you also have your endpoints, and of course, especially for engineers and developers, it's very likely you're going to find SSH keys or AWS secret and access key, GCP credentials, Azure creds, and 
and the good thing from an attacker's perspective with those is that they're often going to be stored clear text with no protection on them. And so you can just easily pivot to those, grab those, and start moving uh, to other hosts. Uh, you also have your GitHub, where, of course, code, uh, secrets can be committed to code. Of course, uh, Kubernetes, where if you happen to land in, in a managed container, um, it's, it's a good chance that that container, like you may land in, is root because a lot of packages are installed that way to make it easy. And once you have root, you could then possibly find a master secret and leverage that elsewhere. So uh, long story short, there's a lot of different uh, places that secrets can be stored. And those are definitely things that uh, red teamers come after. Good old file shares. So in today's day and age, um, I'd say most commonly files are probably stored in the cloud. So like Google Drive or Enterprise Dropbox or Box. Um, but there's still lots of environments where legacy file shares still exist. And um, they're still there for legacy reasons or they're one-off reasons where people don't want to put that stuff in the cloud and so they stand up a file share. And so this attack path still becomes very relevant from an attacker's perspective where you can sleep for port 445, find every host that's listening, and then once you find a host that's listening, you start to enumerate what can, what shares can you see either um, unauthenticated or via credentials that you have. And there's all sorts of stuff that you can find there. You may find like scripts with credentials built in. You may find sensitive PII or financial data. Um, just a lot of a lot of sensitive data that can uh, be of use during a red team operation. So this is an area that I, I definitely recommend that blue teams proactively search for, find, and remediate um, like long before an assessment happens. And then, of course, uh, you have Active Directory, uh, which going back to the earlier slide about how Jamf, a lot of Jamf environments have AD bindings, and that introduces your Active Directory attacks. So um, just kind of walking through the common attack path, which is um, you find a misconfigured AD join server. So it could be Jenkins, as an example, without a password set or with a remote um, code execution uh, vulnerability, um, or also your... Um, your Tomcat, but going back to Jenkins, once you compromise Jenkins, you could get on and find a Jenkins SSH key. And even though that's not the master Jenkins, you may find a Jenkins SSH key that's used for master um, Jenkins on like other test hosts in the environment. So that can present an attack path. Uh, you've got Tomcat, which is also stood up oftentimes with default credentials, which will allow an attacker to upload a war file with a web shell, get access, dump credentials. Uh, same thing for WorkZoo, which is a Python server, which a lot of times is stood up with uh, in debug mode, which will allow you to run Python code on the console page itself and get access to the host. Um, and there's several other examples, I uh, just wanted to call those out. But once you have access, you then kind of move into the recon where you can actually run Bloodhound. And what's cool is Fox IT released a Python collector for Bloodhound. So now you can run uh, the Bloodhound collector from Mac or Linux, as opposed to needing PowerShell or uh, like you know, be able to run um, Sharphound. Then of course you have your password spray. So in Mac environments and uh, Linux environments, like it'd be SSH, like you could spray the username and password, username and SSH key. Um, you could also spray against Active Directory. Once you have a set of credentials, any authenticated user can dump a list of current AD users, and then you can try a single password against uh, every user, such as uh, summer 2020, and see which accounts you get access to. Um, alternatively, you could also spray against Windows servers. Uh, so basically checking SMB with a set of credentials and seeing what hosts um, SMB will give me access to. So there's a lot of tools like uh, Crack Map Exec that can do those kinds of things. Um, and then it kind of brings you to the last part of it where you have your domain compromise, where you find a privileged set of credentials cached, you uh, dump those credentials, and then you start your impersonation where you do pass the hash, pass the ticket, pass the cache, et cetera. Eventually, like you get uh, domain admin creds and then you move to your forged tickets, like your gold and a silver ticket, which then moves you to the next step where you basically dump all employee passwords or uh, hashes and start cracking them, looking for clear text credentials. And then that brings you to the last box there of pivoting. So usually in macOS environments, like compromising Active Directory is not going to be the end goal. Usually it's just a step that you may need. Let's say you, you need a certain account in order to pivot to another environment in order for you to accomplish your objectives. 
Um, and so that's your usually your main reason for coming after AD. It's usually not to say, all right, I've compromised AD, exercise is done. Usually it's more like we needed AD uh, as step B in order to get to C, D, and E in our operation. Another aspect I wanted to point out in modern uh, IT environments in the Bay is the concept of different uh, environment. So I'll, I'll quickly walk through my like, common setup. You have your corporate environment, and that's where your users live. That's where you have your Mac, your Windows endpoints, your uh, Chromebooks, and a lot of the services that users and inter uh, employees interact with, such as you'll have uh, Okta there, Salesforce, Active Directory, various IT application servers, Confluence, Jira, uh, all of those kind of things live in a corporate environment. And then you have your dev environment, and that definitely looks different um, per organization, like you may have a one and one company, a dev environment might just be a dedicated like subnet and uh, like you may or may not have a separate set of credentials to get to that subnet. Whereas in another environment, you may need a separate, complete separate uh, set of credentials and maybe you need to jump like a jump host in order to get to dev. So it kind of depends on what the environment is. And then, of course, you have your production environment where a lot of your microservices and your backend services are. Oftentimes, you'll find customer data stored here. Um, and you'll find various as, various things here, like be mostly Linux, but you may have a like a tiny share of Windows there. You may have some RabbitMQ and Kubernetes and AWS GCP. So you have all of those environments. And then you have your jump hosts in the middle where the, like a typical path would be a certain limited number of, of employees will have access to jump hosts in order to get to the production environment to, to do their jobs. And then, uh, so from a, a red team perspective, you start to think about like what the stated controls are versus what the, what the reality of those controls really are. So one example is you think like, well, are there any direct connections from our corporate environment into production? Um, like it says, we're supposed to only, the, the policy is only go through jump hosts, but are there exceptions? You also think about uh, how the jump hosts are configured. And uh, you start to think, well, are there any exceptions to how those hosts are configured? Maybe you've got three jump hosts that have 2FA enabled and a separate set of credentials. And then maybe there's a fourth one that doesn't have 2FA on it, which presents an easier attack path. So you kind of question that, you, you definitely assess that, or even around your dev environment, are there any relationships between dev and prod? So if you happen to compromise like a CICD pipeline or um, like a Jenkins host in dev, will that, that SSH key or will those tokens work over in prod? Uh, are there shared credentials between the two environments? So these are things that uh, from a red team perspective that uh, we're constantly thinking about as well. It's like what, we know what the stated controls are, but what's the reality of the relationship and, and flow between the different environments? Um, also, just wanted to point out some common low-hanging fruit that uh, red teamers enjoy abusing. Uh, one is APIs, and APIs are everywhere now, especially with uh, cloud services. And um, a couple examples with Docker. So, uh, Carnal Ownage, Chris Gates did a really good write-up on how Docker can be misconfigured to allow anonymous um, API, uh, API execution on containers. And if so, you'll be able to navigate to this host on port 2375 or 70, uh, 2376. And if you can list out the containers, then uh, there's other commands that you can likely run in order to like, execute shell commands and even read secrets um, unauthenticated. Uh, same for Kubernetes nodes, where if uh, system anonymous access uh, for the API is enabled, then you'll be able to hit port 10250 or 10251. And if you can hit that port and see running pods or pods, then you can also like make a, a, a certain um, curl request externally in order to uh, basically do exec API commands and get shell access. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to find that once you get access to a container, you're running as root um, just because of ease of use with how a lot of things are packaged. And so then that presents other opportunities where you can take secrets and like pivot to other hosts. Um, of course, you've got cloud APIs or just APIs in general. One thing that's interesting um, that I've done in the past is if I have a service that uses an API and it's a commercial tool, I'll read the developer documentation and they'll have a sample key there. And I think, well, let me just try it, see if it works. And there's been instances where that sample key actually works. You know, so 
um, there's definitely a lot of opportunity around APIs. Even if you have some custom backend APIs, you could totally um, kind of probe them, see what kind of data you can get back. If there's a number at the end of the API, seeing if you could use something like Burp Intruder and increment on that number, see what kind of data you get back. Um, but you have other areas of, of low hanging fruit like default credentials or stuff with no authentication like VNC, um, servers with browsable content, whereas you're doing directory brute forcing, you may find script with credentials or even unpatched or unmonitored systems. Um, so next, I'm going to just quickly look at some initial, uh, common initial access vectors that are used. Uh, the first example is just your typical external payload fish and pivot. So uh, you send an email with a payload attached. So it could be a, like a dot app package or a macro enabled document for um, Mac OS and the user detonates it. And then you have post exploitation uh, access um, to their Mac host. One thing you could do is if Jamf is enabled, you could check to see if the Jamf binary, or in order to check to see if Jamf is there, you could check to see if the Jamf binary is present. And if it is present, you can do things like just check JSS connection, um, which will basically return the uh, URL of the Jamf server, the Jamf admin server, which may become may come in handy later when you get the credentials to access it. Uh, Jamf version, you can list users from Jamf as well. Um, you can also do your other host recon, typical things that you'll want to do, like what endpoint detection response or antivirus products are running. Are there any secrets on the host? Um, that type of information. You could also prompt the user for credentials with like a fake Apple looking prompt, um, tunneling to other hosts, um, password sprays, you know, your typical post exploitation that you'll basically rinse and repeat over and over until you basically until you accomplish your objectives. So that's one example. Um, another example is external credential harvest fish. Um, I personally think this is a very interesting example given um, the state of things today and how a lot of stuff is federated or cloud-based. Um, but in this example, I'm just showing an example using Evil Jinx 2, which was written by Kuba Gretzky. Uh, it does what, what's called 2FA man in the middle phishing, where it presents a page that a fake page that looks like your actual target login page, and as the user interacts and logs into this fake page, it basically proxies their login uh, to the actual API authentication backend points. So basically proxies, uh, proxies your login, including the 2FA process. And so um, using this, this methodology here, you could actually, even with 2FA enabled, as long as it's not uh, U2F, like if it's just a simple push to your phone, um, this process still works where using Evil Jinx 2, let's say you were targeting Office 365 or Okta, you can get access remotely to someone's Okta, and then you can uh, you have access to things like email access, which you could then use for internal phishing, and internal phishing uh, has a much higher success rate than external phishing because it's actually coming from an employee's account, and it bypasses certain controls that external phishing emails go through. Of course, uh, potentially file access, so if, uh, VPN is not required for things like Google Apps or Google Drive files, then if it's not required to access that and you're in, then you'll have access to those files and you may end up finding very sensitive things, maybe data that should be in production that's actually there in their Google Drive or Dropbox or Box folders. Um, and you have access to other services like Slack, Salesforce. And so what's interesting about this attack path is you could actually, as a red teamer, accomplish your mission objectives without ever landing a payload on a Mac host. And I think this is a very interesting attack path that both, I think, blue team should, should check out, like, what does that look like in our environment if someone has, um, if the same Okta token is being used from multiple places, like especially over a short period of time, what does that look like? Uh, do we have detections for that? Do we have the ability to revoke those those tokens? Uh, things like that. Uh, another example that's really interesting is being able to test your externally facing business units. And so just about every company has some kind of externally facing business unit, like it could be inbound sales or customer support, some part of your organization that interfaces with the public in order to uh, like start an intake for some kind of process. So like in this example, let's say you're dealing with like an inbound like, or I guess a sales organization that, that takes calls. You could actually, uh, from a red team perspective, inject into that process and see 
like as an attacker, if they were to leverage that process, how far could they get? What are our controls? Do we have visibility? Do we have uh, adequate response procedures for that? So in this example, like you could call in and like purport to be some business, kind of social engineer your way in, uh, talk to the rep, build rapport, get their contact information. Uh, once you hang up, like follow up with a benign email and then follow up after that with an actual email with your payload. And then you get initial access like to the host and, and then you kind of what I mentioned earlier, your post exploitation. So what's interesting about this attack path is uh, sometimes like, especially if it's a support team that you're doing this for and they're, they're externally facing, uh, their mail may sit, like the mail actually, if, if it's in Zendesk as an example, may get monitored differently than your corporate email. And so there may be looser controls there that may not, um, that basically where your corporate environment, those controls may not necessarily apply to this environment. So it's a good way to kind of test your visibility and your response here, and also kind of uplift uh, the people involved with that process since they're externally facing just to help with that security awareness and make sure everybody knows what their procedures are um, in the event of an incident. And then of course you have your soon breach model where you have, um, like payload execution by a trusted agent. So it could be an employee that you have a relationship with in the company who's agreed to, to basically run your payload. And maybe they've run it on a separate Mac that doesn't, where they're not doing business work. Um, and they execute your payload and then you kind of go down your, your typical attack path. Um, you could also do like assume the physical access where maybe you come in with a rogue device, plug it in, and then have that rogue device tunnel out to like digital ocean and then you tunnel into digital ocean in order to access the, the uh, device. So there's a lot of different ways you could do that, but assume breach model um, may also allow you to test things like other aspects, like people uh, who leave their computers unlocked, being able to walk by and pop in a uh, bash money or something on their machine. Um, so definitely it's a very interesting um, test path here. So in a nutshell, there's a lot of similarities to Windows environments, really, except for the initial how, um, since it's Mac versus Windows. Um, again, you really don't need domain admin to meet your operational objectives. In most instances, I probably say you don't need it unless like your the path that you're going on requires domain admin in order to get an account and pivot. Um, but there's a lot of different paths you could take and really depends on what your objectives are. Um, so now I'm going to do a more detailed look on the attack side of what the different phases are. So starting with recon, uh, here's some useful recon sources that I personally enjoy using. Uh, the first one is internet registries like Aaron, Apnic, uh, for example, you can actually query your company's name and then get AS numbers and then you query the AS numbers and get IP ranges. And that's a, a quick way to find out what uh, publicly facing IP ranges your company owns. And then one of my personal favorites is DNS text records. And just doing something, something as simple as host-t, dash, dash uh, txt, and then your domain, um, that will basically return your DNS text records. And what you might find, especially in today's time where there a lot of companies have authorized certain organizations to send mail on their behalf, when you look at text records, they may show up there in the text records where you may find something like, um, DocuSign is there or Zendesk as example. And so what that does for me as an attacker is it gives me insight that, all right, if DocuSign is, is listed in your text records, that gives me indication that you're using DocuSign. So if I use that as a phishing, uh, phishing pretext in one of my campaigns, then I can have at least some assurance that it's gonna resonate because the employees there use DocuSign. So it probably would be something that I would use. Uh, Shodan, is uh, excellent as well, where you can feed in those IP ranges that you get that you got from your um, internet registries and AS numbers. You can feed all that stuff into Shodan and search. Another thing I like to do with Shodan is I'll also search SSL certificates uh, by the domain name, and that will actually help you find infrastructure that an organization owns, but that's actually cloud hosted instead of on prem. Of course, you have GitHub, and just about every tech organization now has an organization GitHub page. And then under the organization's GitHub page, they'll often have employees listed. And what's interesting for that is if my objective is to like compromise the build pipeline or access source code, then I could easily go to GitHub, look at the organization and the, 
the uh, employees there and, and identify like who the, the engineers are that I might want to target, who may have certain keys on their machines that I would want to leverage. Um, of course, you got certificate transparency logs that are also interesting with new SSL certs that are stood up, like could also show some test hosts that maybe aren't properly configured that were stood up um, that you may want to poke around with. Uh, various open source tools like the Harvester that you can dig on domains or even do domain or subdomain enumeration or brute forcing. Um, Truffle Hog and tools like that, you could search and point it to GitHub repo and look for secrets that may have been committed. Um, Hunter.io is one of my favorites for getting uh, target email addresses. And really you just have to create an account, log in and you search for the domain and it returns basically, it's basically like a marketing source for um, basically aggregating various marketing sources for email addresses. So you could use that. Um, also you could look for just by using the company's name, .octa.com or .zoom.us or .slack, like in, in order to see if those technologies are present and if so, like they may play a part in your um, social engineering campaign. Uh, from a weaponization and delivery perspective, I'm a huge fan of GoFish. Um, I will say, uh, when using GoFish, just make sure you go through the code and you change the static GoFish um, mail header that's in there. Um, otherwise, like mature organizations that do flag on that, like you'll you'll get seen and um, get stopped pretty early in the campaign. So just make sure you do like those types of checks and changes for GoFish. Uh, but outside of that, I, I think it's an awesome tool and because it has the ability to do pixel tracking, you can do a couple rounds of fishing where you do like a recon fish where you have some kind of like burnable throwaway email. It could be a gift card or something with a link. And uh, as people click that link, you're just collecting user agent information in order to fingerprint like what types of hosts are in the environment. Then you take that data, figure out what those what those types of hosts are, and then you build your payload and then you do your your uh, follow on like actual targeted phishing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, for since most environments have 2FA enabled, if you're looking for credential capturing, uh, Evil Jinx 2 and, and Cred Sniper by Mike Felch, um, those are, are really, really cool tools that um, can still be successful as long as it's not U2F. Um, example payloads. Uh, again, MacFish is a good example of a, pay, of a tool that you can use to generate a macro for Mac. And um, it even does, produces your macro where it's like if, it's an if statement where it's if Mac, then execute this code, else if it's Windows, basically you can have a separate set of macro code there. So really neat. Uh, AppFail by Cody Thomas is probably my favorite uh, because it, it's very flexible with JXA, which we'll talk about later, JavaScript for automation. And it also has payloads like um, Chrome extensions that Chris Ross uh, Zorier uh, wrote and contributed to that. You have shell scripts. Uh, my tool, Mac Shell Swift, does Mako binaries currently. So there's, there's a lot of different options of different payloads that you could select, and we'll talk a little bit more about those as well. But going back to JXA, so JavaScript for automation um, was really supposed to be a replacement, so to speak, for AppleScript because um, AppleScript can get very convoluted for com for very complex tasks. And so um, JavaScript for automation was a way to basically replace or supplement um, those limitations. And so it was brought to light by Cody Thomas um, at SpectreOps a while back around the benefits from an attacker perspective of JXA. And the things I like about JXA is it's hosted, the code, the post exploitation code itself is hosted on a server and your app that you're gonna run on your target clients basically has very few lines of code because really all it's doing is evaling the code, the post exploitation code on a server and it's running it in memory. And uh, because of that, it passes notarization. And so uh, a while back I was trying to figure out like how can we launch how can I build a, an application like a dot app package to, to basically execute JXA without using the OSA script binary? And so that's what that's how I uh, came up with the JXA app concept of doing it all programmatically in order to avoid command line detections and still take advantage of um, the JXA um, benefits on the red team side. Um, so around the notarization piece, I have shared that with Apple in the past, and it's possible that that they're making changes or will make changes soon. Um, but the, as of the, the last time I've tested, this still does pass their notarization check. 
Um, so here's an example of what a JXA app looks like that I wrote a while back. And this one here, um, you can see like this is it. It's, it's not a lot, very few lines of code. And you can see the Apple script uh, command there in the first uh, red box where it's doing an eval statement and it's uh, evaling the JavaScript file that you would put in at the IP and file parameters there. And it's basically executing that, that post exploitation code that's on the server side. So as you can see here, even sending it in for notarization, there's really not much for notarization scanners to key in on because it's everything's on the server side. Uh, so looking at command and control, I just quickly wanted to point out a good read from Tim Malcolm-Vetter around simple, safe red team attack infrastructure. So at a high level, 10,000 foot view, uh, what it's basically saying is you want to be responsible with your red team infrastructure as a as a red teamer. You not only don't you want blue team to be able to find it, crawl it, pick it apart, but you also don't want to have your stuff, your infrastructure out and exposed where it can get compromised. And then your um, environment that you're assessing, like that, that environment gets compromised through your infrastructure. So that would be a terrible scenario. And so he has some real good points there on how to make sure your C2 environment remains protected and also around how to how to be flexible with your C2 so that as things get burned on the blue team side, you don't have to completely stand down your infrastructure, stand it back up. Maybe you just replace a redirector and keep moving. Right. So really good article, both for blue, I think, and red in order to um, kind of understand what that safe and flexible infrastructure looks like. Also around the command and control side of things, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different options. So Jorge or Chies and company have done a good job at the C2 matrix of testing and evaluating different command and controls, including Mac OS based ones. Um, some of the ones here like Empire 3.0 still lives, lives on um, and is still maintained. You have AppFell, you have Evil OS X, of course you have Metasploit, um, There's so lots of different options and there's lots of different payloads, like, right? We talked about Office macros and browser, browser extensions and you have Apple Script, Python, and each of those has their own pluses and minuses that you'll want to pick based on your operational needs. For instance, Python has the benefit of currently it's up to this point is still included by default on Mac OS, even though that that's supposed to change in the near future. But uh, Python scripts aren't run through Gatekeeper, so you don't have to deal with the whole signing and notarization. The downside, however, is it's super easy to detect. So uh, each of these has that kind of pro and con to it that you'll pick based on what you're looking to do in the environment, and what your operational goals are. And then you have, um, of course, you have different C2 types, like you, you may have your typical beaconing over HTTP or HTTPS, DNS, or you just may have a consistent TCP socket uh, to an IP and port where your C2 happens. So it all depends on what you're looking to do for your objectives. Uh, around the post-exploitation side, I just wanted to point out a few things uh, by Zorier, Chris Ross. Um, he just released on his GitHub site uh, a set of secu Mac OS security tools to definitely check out. Um, it's got things like uh, shell code runners and um, here's an example of, of a keylogger for Mac OS that works. And, um, What's cool about it is if you're just looking to get common user keystrokes, you don't even need sudo for it. You do need sudo if you're looking to get like protected field values like passwords, um, but that's something to definitely check out. Also, Malware Unicorn at Facebook did a workshop on Dialib injection techniques, kind of what that looks like, what the flow looks like, what an example payload is. So that's something you could do, and it's it's a, it's really a hands-on workshop that you can follow along. Um, so you can check that out. Um, you can also pull data of interest from like a, a host you have access to. So this is a tool that I wrote uh, called Swift Belt, and it's written in uh, Swift, so it's native to Mac OS. And I called it Swift Belt because I was inspired by HarmJoy at SpectreOps, like his seatbelt tool on the Windows side. And so this is basically an enumerator that uses API calls, does not use any command line utilities, and it can do things like enumerate security tools on a system, look for your bash history, browser history, launch agents, clipboard content, um, see if Slack is present, and if it is, extract some Slack data. And so uh, you could actually, for your op, have this, cap this type of capability automatically execute as soon as you get access. Um, and have that have it pull back for the operator. So definitely take a look. Um, Blue teams even check it out and see if there's anything like that. The only thing I saw that that really detected is um, the Apple Endpoint Security Framework. 
uh, which definitely can log like file accesses and reads. Um, so it's all out of that activity. But I definitely recommend playing around with it and getting familiar with it. Also on the post exploitation side, you can see if OS query is present and if it's present, you can use it from an attacker perspective. So um, I also have a blog on this where I was curious about this and, and played around with it and built the example into Mac Shell Swift where uh, because I'm a big fan of Facebook's OS query project and for those that are not familiar, it's a way to ask questions of your remote host. It's cross-platform and it allows you to ask questions such as like who last logged in or uh, what running processes are on the system or what's the, the uh, bash history, things like that. And so I was curious, like, well, I wonder if an attacker could actually leverage it um, just by invoking it remotely. Um, so I played around with it and was able to get that going. Um, it does use command line utilities in order to invoke it, so it's detectable that way. However, I'll, my personal guess is that most environments probably are not monitoring OS query invocations, so it probably would not go detected, even though it's easily detectable. Um, but my general rule is uh, it's pretty safe in uh, the Mac OS world as long as you stay off the command line. Um, you're pretty safe at this at this stage. Um, in terms of credentials, you could uh, prompt like for credentials using the OSA script binary, which again feeds into command line history. Or alternatively, you can call the OSA script or the NS Apple script class or even the OSA kit class in order to prompt um, without using on the OSA script binary. Um, around persistence, uh, a lot of techniques out. So Sentinel-1, I'll just reference their blog posts as they step through the, the, uh, a lot of the common methods for, for uh, persistence on Mac OS. So I won't jump through too many of these because I know a lot of us are familiar with launch agents and launch daemons and cron jobs. Uh, configuration profiles is often, I learned this from Thomas Reed, but uh, a lot of adware is using configure, has been up to this point using configuration profiles in order to um, accomplish their objectives. So um, one, of, one of the aspects of persistence I wanted to point out was folder actions in a blog by Cody Thomas. Um, that was the first place I'd heard about it, where you can basically uh, pick a folder, and once the user interacts with that folder, you can set it to run an Apple script from disk somewhere. So um, there's a lot of little caveats and, and nuances to it, but it's a very interesting um, persistence technique that I definitely recommend you check out. Um, I won't spend too much time here because we kind of talked about these as well, what lateral movement tends to look like in a macOS environment via creds that are stolen or spraying, um, usernames and keys or passwords. Um, so yeah, we kind of covered this already. So next I'm going to talk to adversary simulation and emulation. Uh, the best example that I've heard is from Tim Malcolmvetter where he um, explain adversary emulation as having a very specific threat profile. So it's like based on a threat intelligence report, a uh, specific APT actor, and taking their TTPs and emulating them in your environment, basically being that adversary in your environment and seeing how your detections and response hold up. Whereas adversary simulation does not have a specific threat profile, but a more general threat profile of what a capable adversary would likely do, like what types of tactics and TTPs might they run. So I thought that was a really good example. And um, even though today most um, threat intel data is on Windows T TTPs. I do believe that uh, we can run adversary emulations and simulations for Mac as well. Um, an example for an emulation is I think you can emulate the activity of known Mac OS malware families like Schlayer. Even uh, Thomas Reed has done a lot of analysis around some adware campaigns that do some pretty nasty things that you may want to emulate. Um, so those are examples of what you could pull from. You could pull from Patrick Wardle's Mac Malware of 2019 report. And then in terms of simulations, you can take threat intel reports and basically create a Mac OS equivalent as close as possible to simulate that activity. So here's an example with the Schlayer campaign. And this is actually from June of this year from an Antigo report. But users were, or, or people were getting infected by Google searching for videos where they would find like a fake flash outdated page, uh, which would download a DMG. It would have like a picture with instructions on it and um, basically instructions for them to execute this file that looks like a, an app. It has an app, like a flash app image, but it's really a shell script. And then once that script is, uh, is executed, it drops a zip locally 
in the temp directory. And then inside of that zip, there is an app that uh, basically downloads the real flash and downloads uh, follow on malware. So you can see examples here of what that looks like. So if you were to emulate that exact uh, malware family, this is kind of what one way you could do it. You could send an email with a link to a DMG. Um, I can entice the user to download the DMG, which and include like a picture with instructions, have your shell script masquerading with the flash icon. And I think MD Sec Labs did a really good write-up on uh, like file icon and file extension tricks on Mac OS. Um, so you could uh, have them execute that shell script uh, masquerading as Flash, and then have it uh, download a zip locally to the machine, which includes an app package that runs, that downloads real Flash, and then maybe you download like uh, some other C2 framework or some other malware. So that's an example you could use to emulate uh, Schlayer. And then on the simulation side, as I mentioned, um, since most threat intel reports are Windows-based, um, what I like to do is just try to figure out how close on the Mac side can we get to it. So on the Windows example might be like Office to CMD to PowerShell. Maybe in Mac you have Office spawn NSH, which then runs Python. Or like prompting with a fake prompt. On the Windows side, you're using a logon screen API call, but maybe on the Mac side, you use OSA script basically to do the same thing. Uh, same with password spraying, whereas in Windows environment, you, you may spray over SMB. Here you'll spray over SSH. Uh, so just very rudimentary examples, but that's kind of my mentality when it comes to simulation. Like take these TTPs and do a Mac OS equivalent as close as possible to those. So next, um, I'll look at some challenges and opportunities uh, specific to Mac OS. So here's a really cool chart from Howard Oakley. Um, he writes a lot of cool stuff from, uh, for Mac OS from time to time. So here's a link where you can dig in deeper. Also, Phil Stokes at Sentinel One did a blog post. And essentially, there's three components, three security components for Mac OS. You have your protect side, which is your signing, your notarization, gatekeeper. You have detect, which is around uh, like YAR rules for certain things, blacklist hashes, other stuff that um, Apple threat analysts are seeing um, in the wild. And then you have your remove, which is your malware removal um, tool application. So it's interesting, you've got those three components. And I will say for the detect side, for Xprotect, um, that tends to be like stuff that they have seen in the wild. So if you're writing your own malware, I've never had any issues personally with uh, Xprotect because again, it's not in the wild. So there's nothing for it to really key in on. So I'm gonna talk a little bit quickly about Gatekeeper since I know time is running short. Um, the com.apple.quarantine attribute is appended by the operating system to any file that's downloaded via the browser. And then Gatekeeper checks certain file types for that attribute. And if that attribute is present, it will check to see if that file has been signed with a valid developer ID. And for recent versions of Mac, it will also check to see if that uh, file has been submitted and pass notarization or has like a, a ticket, notarization ticket staple to it. And if it passes both of those, then it will actually give the user a prompt and say, are you um, like, do you want to run it? Or I forgot the exact contents of the message. But um, so that's kind of a nutshell how Gatekeeper operates and it poses challenges for, for red teams because eventually like scripting languages that have been exempt from Gatekeeper are, are eventually going to be removed from Mac OS. And so you're going to have to basically come with like Objective-C base code or Swift base tool, um, which is going to mo most likely if you're looking to get a payload on the system, have to go through that process, which is why earlier I thought it was very interesting about targeting SAS and federated apps where you don't even need to touch Mac endpoints. So um, around the signing process, here's an example of what it might look like on the red team side where you create or use an email that you already have, create an Apple ID, use a phone number for two-factor verification or a device, a uh, separate device for two-factor authentication. Then you um, get your Apple developer account that you pay $99 for. So you have two options there when you're paying for that. If you use an account, like a credit card that's not tied to your username, Apple will take your money. Yes, they will. And uh, and still kind of hold your process and ask that you send in like a valid uh, identification like driver's license. Uh, the other side of it is you use a bank um, issue card with your identity. You get it signed, but you run your op. Blue team finds it. They analyze it and then they see your developer ID so they know it's you. So it's kind of a lose-lose scenario here. 
Another approach is you could register an LLC and use that for your um, signing, which you could do, but it's a lot of work up front and um, you still may hit the same like snafu with it around the identity part if the identities don't match. So it just has, got to be real careful with that, but that's, this is another option as well. So again, you have to sign and notarize, and then there's other challenges too, like hardened runtime is required for notarization. Um, sandboxing app transport security kind of determines once your app is running, what it can communicate out to. So there's different layers there that are um, challenging. So a real quick area around notarization testing. Um, so I did a couple tests and um, I just want to share the results with, those, with you of those tests. One, I built a red team app that stole creds and launched AppFell, submitted it for notarization. It was successfully notarized in five minutes, but it was revoked about a week later. So um, basically I had a week to use it, which was really interesting. And it showed me about the notarization process about basically how stuff's notarized up front and there's some kind of back end check after the notarization. Um, here's an example of the code. So you can see it's clearly a credential stealer, username and password. Um, a second app I wrote this time, took out the credential stealing code and just had to execute app fail. In other words, just a JXA app. This time, submitted for notarization, notarized in minutes, developer account was never revoked. So this is that same screenshot from earlier where there's not much to key in on because all the code, post exploitation code is server side. So again, uh, JXA apps, just wanted to show you an example there. And, um, and basically, if you want to build your own like JXA um, C2 application and not use what AppFill has, you'll, you'll need to be strong or pretty good in Objective-C. Because right now, uh, there is a, a bridge between JavaScript and Objective-C, but a similar bridge with Swift has not yet been established to my knowledge. So some general uh, defensive recommendations as we close out. Uh, some people just I wanted to recommend you pay, keep an eye on Patrick Wardle, Richie Cyrus, Thomas Reed, Sarah Edwards on the defensive side. They're doing a lot of cool work. Um, definitely check them out. On the offensive side, the evil bit, Chris Ross, uh, Cody Thomas, Phil Stokes, uh, check them out. Um, I have a blog that I put up earlier this year on Mac OS detections, like some base level detections. Um, that I think should be in any macOS environment. So check that out. I uh, also did a test with Apple Endpoint Security Framework where I ran the tool that I wrote, Mac Shell Swift, against it and did various post-exploitation tasks just to see what was captured. So you can see that blog there. I um, also recommend monitoring Jamf AD groups, ensuring you have AD seg seg segmentation or segregation where I'd assume your AD is going to get compromised. But when it does get compromised, you don't want it, everything else, all the other cards to fall. Also, if not uh, needed, don't enable SSH on every managed Mac by default. Um, if you're using remote management, I recommend randomizing the password as we talked about earlier, and then separating your keys and tokens between your environments. Uh, also getting visibility into cloud abuse. So like if certain uh, very powerful cloud permissions are assigned, like make sure you can detect that in your environment. So in summary, um, EDR is getting better for Mac OS, but Gatekeeper uh, continues to pose challenges on the red team side, which is good. Um, Swift is easier to learn, but I'd say Objective-C is more beneficial for the time being, especially around the reason for JXA and Objective-C having a bridge with JavaScript where Swift is not, even though I enjoy the Swift syntax a bit better. Um, Again, targeting federated login services can be even more impactful than targeting Mac endpoints. And you can do emulations and simulations in Mac OS environments, uh, basically just as you can in Windows environments as well. Just have to kind of change it and adopt it. Um, let's see here. Resources, a bunch of different resources. So check these out when you have time. Um, a lot of different articles, a lot of cool people doing um, some interesting work in the Mac OS space. So uh, thank you for your time. Again, Omar, I appreciate you and the team uh, giving me the opportunity. And I'll be on uh, Twitter and on Discord for anybody who has questions, feel free to reach out.